Hi everyone, happy Sunday. I hope you had a good weekend. Tonight we're going to discuss the concepts of consumer and producer surplus. These are both important concepts because they help us to understand how much benefit producers and consumers receive in a marketplace. They uh, also help us understand why consumers decide to buy at certain prices and producers decide to sell at certain prices. Let's take a look at some charts and graphs that come straight out of the book, out of Module 49. I think they do a good job of explaining this concept. First of all, you'll notice uh, on this slide that we have a demand curve derived from individual consumers and the intersection of the amount of books that they are willing to purchase at a certain price. So. For example, Alicia is willing to spend $59, Brad is willing to spend $45, Claudia $35, and so on and so on. So what you have here is a demand curve for the market for, in this case, used books. So a total of five books would be sold, one to each of these potential consumers. If we set a price at, this case, $30, we have the initiation of something called a consumer surplus. Consumer surplus really is the sum of individual consumer surpluses. So, for example, Alicia was willing to spend $59, and she only had to pay $30 in this case. Brad, $45. He paid $30, of course, because the market price is $30. Claudio is willing to pay $35. So you can see their individual consumer surpluses here. Total consumer surplus is just the area represented by the sum of these three consumer surpluses. Now, keep in mind the idea of consumer surplus, that term applies to both individual and total consumer surplus. So make sure you're looking out for context of a problem or a discussion to make sure you understand whether we're talking about one person or multiple people. Okay, so we know how to calculate total consumer surplus and individual consumer surplus, what happens if the price of a product changes? Well, if the price of a product changes, in this case, if we have a decrease in price, we simply look at the change from the initial consumer surplus, which was the sum of these three areas, and we add to it any additional surplus represented by, again, the difference between what someone was willing to pay and what they have to pay. So in this case, Alicia's consumer surplus went from $29, or 59 minus 30, to uh, $39, 59 minus 20. Similarly, Brad's increased by $10, Claudia's increased by $10, and that initial total surplus, which was the sum of these three areas, increased by this amount. So that's the first part of the effect of a change in price. Additionally, in the case of a decrease in price, additional consumers will come into the market because their minimum or rather maximum threshold of price will have been met. In this case, in the original price of $30, Darren wouldn't have purchased because he was only willing to pay $25. But at a price of $20, not only will he buy a book, he has experienced his own consumer surplus of $5. Darren's total of $5 gets added to the other three in order to derive total consumer surplus in this case. Total consumer surplus is, as we discussed, the sum of areas under the demand curve. And here it's, here it's jagged because we have individual purchase prices. But if I were to draw a line roughly here and increase this from five purchasers to thousands of thousands of total purchasers, what you get is something that looks more like what's on this page, which is a more traditional demand curve, downward sloping demand curve, and the total consumer surplus at a given price, again, make sure you're always talking about at a given price, represented by the equal area, excuse me, the area below the demand curve, so below the demand curve, but above the price. Now we flipped examples here from textbooks to computers, but it doesn't really matter. We have here price of $1,500 for a computer, surplus representing the area between what each of these individual consumers along this line, along the demand curve, what each of them was willing to pay and what they had to pay. 
looking down here, if we if this actually represented a, a change in price, if the original price were five thousand dollars, well, at five thousand dollars, we have at at five thousand dollars we have two hundred thousand individuals willing to buy computers. The surplus would have been this area, this white area. If the price went from five thousand to fifteen hundred dollars, there are again two forms of increase. First of all, the increase in consumer surplus from those individuals who were buying at five thousand dollars, plus all of the new buyers who weren't willing to buy at five thousand but were willing now to buy at a price of fifteen hundred dollars. Those additional eight hundred thousand consumers measured along the demand curve. So pretty straightforward, I think, simply taking a look at the area under the demand curve and above the price. Let's flip and look at producer surplus and the supply curve. Same idea, exact same idea, but instead of looking at a demand curve, which would go this way, we're looking at our traditional supply curve, which goes this way. Again, here we have individual suppliers rather than in individual consumers. And rather than looking at the price they were willing to pay along the demand curve, here we're looking at cost. Now, what is individual producer surplus? Well, individual producer surplus is represented by their cost, so what they were willing to sell for, the difference between that and the market price. In this case, for Andrew, Andrew's producer surplus is 25. Betty's is 15 and Carlos's is 5. Now you'll notice at this price Donna and Engelbert are unwilling to sell because their minimum price threshold has not been met. So again you have individual producer surpluses here, total producer surplus represented by the sum of these three areas. If we turn that into thousands of suppliers we get an area here similar to what we would have seen in consumer surplus had we had a demand curve. Instead, with the producer surplus, you're looking at the area above the supply curve and below the price. Similar to a change in price and how it might impact demand, we see in the case of increased price for producers, we see an expansion of the producer surplus that happens in two ways. If this were the original surplus at $5, so again the area above the supply curve and below the price, when the price goes to $7, two things happen. First of all, we get an increase in producer surplus to the original sellers because they were all willing to sell at this price, but you also get new sellers who are willing to go into the marketplace. In this case, I believe it was these two, Donna and Engelbert, who wouldn't have been willing to do it. Well, I'm sorry, it's a different example, but you get the point. You have sellers who were unwilling at this price, but now they're willing at this price. And we see surplus, additional surplus represented by this area, and the new total producer surplus would be the entire area under the curve. I think these are pretty straightforward ideas. They're another good example of understanding why uh, our basic fundamental understanding of the supply and demand curves is so important and it's a good way for us to start analyzing why consumers and producers make the buying and selling decisions they do. That's it. Have a great evening and I'll see you in class tomorrow.